गया 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 Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 30th anniversary of the Black History Celebration Lecture. Um, this evening, we have a wonderful panel in store for you. I am Shudere, the president of the Kansas Lyric Foundation, and we are broadcasting live from SOS Studio in St. Martin. And we have a wonderful panel of Caribbean people that are joining us this evening. I am not going to do the introduction. I'm just here to welcome everybody as the president of this foundation. And thank you for joining us for this 30th anniversary, which we are very proud to celebrate. I am going to turn the floor over to our host for the evening, which is the Dynamics and Beats and Peters. Thank you very much for joining us, Cindy. And you take it from there. Welcome, everyone. Again, I just want to reiterate what Suja said in terms of it being our 30th, I would say it again, 30th annual Black History um, celebration and lecture series. I want to, since I have the mic and I have the floor, I want to really shout out to the Conscious Living Foundation, 30 years strong celebrating Black history, right? And not just Black history as we see it in the United States, but being very intentional about bringing scholars and authors and artists from the region right, from the region to tell us about who we are, whose we are, and how important our history is to the greater world and the contributions that we've given to the region, and to remind us that we are a great people and we have so much work to do in terms of pursuing our liberation. So I just wanted to give uh, Suja his flowers while he yet lived and the rest of the Conscious Lyrics Foundation members and team. I just wanna give you a shout out. I think everybody in the audience in the world, wherever you may be, you may want to give them a round of applause because I think that is just a great effort, right? I would say that the Conscious Lyrics Foundation has and continues to come to the narrative, which I call the three C's that in St. Martin in particular, that we're crime ridden, that we're corrupt, and we have a low capacity to govern. But what the Conscious Lyrics Foundation has done is they are committed, right? Committed to changing that narrative. That's the first C. They have a heart for the community and understanding that it's important to our citizens to know who we are. And thirdly, the courage. It's taken them 30 years strong, irregardless of the you know, the backlash that they may have received because sometimes these messages are top lessons that we need to learn. And not always we are welcome in spaces that make us confront, you know, the challenges that we see in our society and remind us that history is our great teacher and we don't repeat the same mistakes. So again, 
kudos to the Council of Foundation. So why are we here today? We are here today to discuss a very exciting, I would say, team. Some people may say a negative team, you know, the, the dangerous D word, decolonization. But it's important because it's a necessary conversation to have. And we will continue having it until the process is complete. I want to remind you that when we listen to the world decolonization, it is not just a political process, but it's also a process that has entangled our economy, our judicial system, our cultural fabric, our healthcare system, our educational system, right? These are all elements that have been impacted by the colonization process. And just think about it. If you are frozen in a particular system, right? You would need to defrost. So that's what a decolonization process is. Defrosting from that frozen in time system that we've been a part of and really letting us go and be who we are and who we are meant to be in our spaces, in our mind, bodies, and souls. Right. So think about that as we as we move forward this evening. I also want us to listen to this quote before I introduce my panel this evening, my esteemed panel this evening. As we, I want us to think about this and sit with this as we move forward. This is a quote that I, or, or yeah, a quote, but a piece out of a of a text by author Octavia Butler, and her piece Parable of the Talents. She was a known science fiction writer in her time. I think she was one of three during her period. She's passed on now, but her, she, she, she had a birthday this week and they were recalling her work and how important she was and what a groundbreaking individual she was in her time. And she left us with these words. She said, all, she said, beware. All too often we say what we hear others say. We think what we are told that we think we see what we're permitted to see. Worse, we see what we're told that we see. Repetition and pride are the keys to this. They hear, I mean, sorry, to hear and to see even an obvious lie again and again and again. Maybe to say it almost by reflex and then to defend it because we've said it. And at last to embrace it because we've defended it. And because we cannot admit that we've embraced and defended an obvious lie, thus without, without thought, without intent, we make mere echoes of ourselves and we say what we hear others say. So just sit with that as we have this conversation this evening. I call this conversation in the word of Walter Rodney, a grounding session with our our people in the region as we dissect this team, decolonization, and in the more local context in St. Martin, we're under the San Mark Street this evening as we're delving in to how and yeah, how we can move forward in decolonize in this decolonization process and what it looks like. And that it's not as intimidating or a detriment to our society, but more of a liberating process as we move forward. So who do we have this evening with us? We have with us Mr. Antonio Carmona Baez, which is the president of the, Uni the University of St. Martin. He has taught general social sciences and political science at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Pedras, and political science at the University of Amsterdam, where he received his PhD in international relations. Dr. Baez is, an, uh, is the author of State Resistance and Globalization in Cuba, which was in 2004. And he's also the author of various articles and chapters and contributions on political economy, social policy, Caribbean labor, and the decolonial thought. He served as a political analyst and consultant for the Latin American embassies in The Hague and led training workshops in Africa and the Middle East turned diplomats at the Klingendale Netherlands Institute of International Relations. So he's well versed in his area. Jenzira Davis Kaina, respectfully known as Dr. Chen, 
is a cultural griot, artist, educator, published art and motivational speaker, media technologist, ordained priestess, visionary activist, community developer, le legacy builder, mother and grandmother. Davis Kaina is the is a founding director of Per Ang um, Sematawi, an international NGO NPO institutionalizing culture, healing, arts, technology, and spirituality for life, inspiration, freedom, and education. She also is a director of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center and is a teaching faculty in liberal arts and social science at both universities of the Virgin Islands, which is the only HBCU in the Caribbean. Josephine Gums Connor, attorney at law and former legal advisor of the Chief Minister of Anguilla, she accompanied and provided advice to the Anguilla delegation on its annual official visits to the Joint Ministerial Council in the United Kingdom, where all heads of overseas territory and crown dependencies engage in bilateral discussions on matters affecting individual territories with the British government counterparts. And our last, and then definitely not least, our very own, Lasana Suku, who is the gem, one of our gems of our soil. He's a St. Martin writer, journalist, publisher. He's the author of Nativity, Brotherhood of the Spurs, The Salt Reaper, Corazon de Pelicano, Hurricane Protocol, of, and which is a required reading at, at Caribbean and North American, South American European universities. And he's also, it's um, considered to be a James Meshner Fellow and has been translated in Spanish, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Turkish, and Chinese. So that's why I call him one of, one of our gems. So we have had an introduction to our panel. And as I said, this is a grounding session. So I want us to delve into this question this evening. This is from a political perspective as we dive into the different elements of the decolonization process, all right? So the remaining colonies of the Caribbean and struggled towards independence. From your various, ex your various experiences, can you speak to, is this a reality? Is this a myth? Because in our space, some people think it's a myth in terms of a still being a colony and not having to go through the decolonization process and the struggle towards independence is not seen in, in, in such a word as something to aspire to. So can we speak to this? Who would like to go first? Mr. Seku, would you wanna grace us with your thoughts on this idea? Thank you, Cindy. Um, greetings to the fellow brother and sister panelists, and many thanks to, to Conscious Stewards and Sujura for this um, continual platform as you, you outlined so well, so that we could meet like this in various ways. And success into the future as we continue to rendezvous with victories. Um, you know, uh, rather than, than talk to the doubt issue, and some of the other panelists may want to, to, to address that. Um, I, I would prefer to look at, you know, relative to, 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 to the remaining colonies in our region, we are talking from, from Cayman up to Bermuda, if you must include Bermuda, I, I, I would think it's important too, uh, even though it's further north. Um, we're talking about over 15, between 15 to 20 territories that are still um, colonies of, of, of the European um, uh, um, countries that, that, that um, invaded, that enslaved, that have essentially been at war with the Caribbean for over 200 years when we marked the invasion, including the US as well, if we draw that in, when we marked the invasions, when we marked brutality of enslavement, when we marked the genocide, when we marked the undermining and, and massacres of, 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 of um, when the Doran's um, labor uprisings. And so this is part of, of, of this context. So these, these, these 15 to 20 territories being um, territories by any name, and however the Europeans of late within the last 10 to 20 years have been trying to, to dress it up like a, a, a monkey in a mini dress, they remain but that, a territory by any other name is still a territory mm -hmm. and, and, and as, 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 I, as I look at it and as others who are engaged in the process look at it. And beyond that, I would say, 
Um, what is important, however seminal it may be, in every one of those territories, there are voices or foundations like in St. Martin, the Independence Foundation, um, that have been attending to this issue, that has been voicing the concerns of this issue, that have been voicing how the, the, the uh, in a Bonaire, maybe they are, they are looking, they are focusing more on, on their autonomy as, coming out, as instead of coming straight out and saying, well, you know, we should be independent. So there are different stages of this, but they are attending to this issue. And the fact that they are attending to this issue suggests, it's, it suggests, but states its reality. It's a continuum of history. It's a continuum of our struggle for liberation from the days of, of, of the Amerindians, from the days of the Maroons, upwards to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the grandfathers of our independence, Haiti, Santo Domingo, Cuba, and onward to, to, to the other countries that have gained their, their independence and are engaging a process that by, by any means is a, is a normal struggle. I always try to use this fact that I am, you know, I'm like maybe um, around 60, and um, I'm older than, than most of, of the Caribbean countries. And I had a little trouble growing up. So don't think, you don't think a, a country with like 100,000 people or a million people or 10 million people is going to have just a little bit of a problem growing up? Yes, yes. but meanwhile, they are progressing. Every single one of our countries that have, that have become independent, every single one of them are better off today than they were under colonialism, than they were under enslavement. And they are, they are doing it challenged by significant powers um, around them in their neighborhood, the, 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 the Congo and the North, or the American, or, or, the, or the, 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 the political and, and economic interests out of Europe. And so that struggle is still going on. So I prefer to attend to the fact that, yes, it is a reality, and that in every territory, there may be one voice, there may be a movement that is seminal, there may be a foundation that is seminal, there are discussions that is going on that are increasing, and that their voices talking relative to their autonomy and or straight up talking about independence. And that is progress. And, and, and those voices, uh, what we are doing here today, I think is an investment in that, that type of progress. It's consistent with our history as Caribbean people. And, and just like how there are those who, who negate it and say, nah, that's not, you know, um, da, da, da. well, those countries that have moved on to independence also had those that were against it and that were often in the political apparatus, either as, as, as functionaries or the colonialists was there in charge. And those countries still got over that hump and are moving on forward and are passing significantly a lot of the territories that when everybody was a territory, you know, sometimes the Netherlands and Antilles and so on would say, oh, we this and we that and we got this and we got that. But a lot of the country that used to pop style on are, are, are passing them, leaving them in the dust because um, the anomaly of colonialism can go but so far. There is absolutely no successful colony in the history of human beings. You know, there may be a colony that served the master or the empire or the, it's, it's material or it's human lot that was oppressed served serve that um, in, in subjective ways. But for the people of that place, they have never been and there never will be a successful um, territory or colony to the fullest um, uh, fulfillment and viability and sovereignty of that nation. Thank you for your insight, Dr. Chenzira. Greetings, everyone. Cindy. And first and foremost, I just would like to make sure that I offer a significant echo to the works of Conscious Lyrics Foundations. 30 years is really a powerful, powerful statement to even have the discussions around decolonization, reparatory justice, independence, self-determination, whether it's during Black History Month, February, or Black History Month, UK, October, or African Liberation Month in May, and all the other, we have we have observances every month, so we could make this happen. Oh, 365, that be that would be special. I'd like to start with a quote that comes from a site, a website entitled "A People's Historical Journey to Self Determination." I'm going to say it again: "A People's Historical Journey to Self Determination." A P is in people. H is in house, J is in justice to the number, S is in self, D is in determination.com. And I will share it in the chat. 
Virgin Islanders, this is a quote, a quiet and humble people should not be allowed to rule themselves for 100 years. And when so, should be done under white rule for there are militants among them. And that's a quote from the Naval Governor Sumner Eli Wetmore Kittel when there was the newly created Virgin Islands of the United States in the 1920s, specifically uttered, put in writing, part of the policy in 1922, since the transfer and purchase of the land, the resources happened in 1917 for $25 million in gold. And there's always the inquiry, where did the United States acquire $25 million in gold? to actually purchase these islands of, that are now known as the Virgin Islands of the United States. And what happened to the inhabitants that were here? Primarily people of African descent. So when persons speak of the questioning of whether there was colonization or whether or not we're a colony, by definition, the Virgin Islands, the US portion, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John, Water Island, and the attached keys are identified as a non-incorporated, non-self-governing territory of the United States. That's the sound so eloquent, so sterile, so sanitized, when in actuality, it's, we're still a colony. And so there's a significant thrust here of brothers and sisters, and I say it very clearly, that have consistently from 1917, and even before that, kept this energy, this organizational thrust of self-determination, some layer of independence, some type of engagement, some type of liberation and unification with social governance that protected those inhabitants that inherited this new colonial status. You know, being a colony for Denmark from 1733 to 1917, and then having this transfer purchase in 1917, it's 2021, we're in the seventh year of the International Decade for People of African Descent, where we're supposed to be rec into recognition, justice, and development. And we can't have the conversation without there being an issue of threat of, you're not appreciating what the benevolent sovereign entity has provided for you. You should consider yourself honored to be a part of this particular sovereign entity, irrespective of the fact that them don't like you when them don't like you. Mm. They don't include you when they don't include you. So that conversation on decolonization has been very rampant. It's been very active. It's been very engaging. And we have to do it in a way that again, protects our safety in many respects, because sometimes persons feel that you are becoming a rabble rouser or you're being, they just, I just read it to you. There are militants among them because you are in the quest for what are essentially are inalienable and unalienable human rights. So that, you know, I'm sure in the balance of the discourse, we'll get to expand on that, but just to give the context of what exists and again, encouraging people to go to the a people's historical journey to self-determination. It's a host of resources and research and papers and treaties and constitution drafts of which we have been unsuccessful five times because you have to have the permissions of the US Congress to actually develop and pass forward a constitution here in the Virgin Islands of the US. It reminds mothers of what happens when you have a pregnancy beyond nine months, stillbirth. So we're moving in the direction to shift from that and to be more engaging, more active and so forth. So I really appreciate the opportunity to just share that opening with that first inquiry. Hi. I see that uh, Cindy may have left us, but if I may just have the opportunity to just jump in. Um, first of all, uh, of course, it's a very uh, 
great pleasure of mine to be in such illustrious company. Uh, and so coming from just on the other side of the water of St. Martin and Gwila, uh, you know, we're here, here we are, uh, all of us, um, you know, thrusting ahead in an area that still plagues us all. And so for me, um, as an opener, you know, I, I, when, I, when I thought about the, the, the decolonization as our subject matter, I kind of looked at it from the angle that from a political standpoint, I often wonder, uh, given the great heritage and the journey that we have had as black people who were enslaved, I wonder when we, when we examine decolonization, what is the impact that has so dulled our senses, our collective senses as a people who should want to be innately free? And why are we still fighting our own people to move into the direction that amplifies the whole, the entirety of them as a people, free to be able to chart our own course. And, you know, I, when we look at history and we recognize that even in the midst of slavery, there were those in our heritage who pushed forward, um, refusing to accept the immediate strangleholds that, 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 that would cloud their judgment to try to be free. And then there were those who just accepted and felt that there was no better fate for them. And so here are we 200, plus 400 plus years later. And even now, with the benefit of education, far more than our ancestors would have had, we are still in the throes of fighting for freedom. And so one of the things that I certainly would like us to explore in this discussion is the factors that press upon that innate sense of fighting for freedom. Factors that actually push our people, even some of the more educated in our communities to say, what is our value? How can we be free? How will we survive? They're asking the most basic questions that pigeonhole us back into staying where we are as opposed to moving forward. And, you know, I often reflect when um, Martin, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King the celebration of his day. And I, I, I sometimes try to look back into some of his sermons. And the one that triggered me this year was going back to where he examined the, 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 the concept of those persons who in the height of the civil rights movement were saying, why are you rushing? You know, take time, um, stop pushing so fast. Um, time will solve the problem. And his response was, I think, so apt when he said, time is neutral. Time can be used constructively or destructively. The forces working against you are using time very efficiently. And I pause there because while we as 
black people, the colonized, are sorting out ourselves about whether now is the appropriate time, whether we really should be on this journey, whether we shouldn't give ourselves more room and scope, the administering powers who administer us are using time very much in their favor efficiently. And I speak in terms of Anguilla's perspective, for example, where um, one of the factors that the, and, and, and I suppose it is a factor that is perhaps common to all of us. One of the factors um, is debt in our countries. One of the factors is um, poverty. Uh, one of the factors that uh, fight against us is just our location. The, 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 the fact that we are open to natural disasters and as small island states, do not have the wherewithal to, um, although we, we, we preach re resiliency and there is resiliency amongst us, there are still those economic factors that, that we contend with. And so here are factors that administering powers are able to pigeonhole us, to make us doubt whether we have the temerity, whether we have the gravitas in this fight for freedom. And I say this only to make the point that for example, while we in Anguilla may question whether now or 10 years from now or whenever is the right time to fight for independence, we have at the same time our administering power who is pushing a program of global Britain. In other words, if we do not find ourselves and find ourselves quickly, we will find that rather than independence, we are going to be in assimilation. And when we are assimilated, we must know as a black people, we would have lost not just um, who we are from a cultural standpoint, but we lose even more, which is that innate sense of freedom and that innate fight for our integrity and for our, our worth, will, we will find is completely eradicated. So these discussions are not just pivotal, but I do hope that more than that, we are stimulating the intellect of our people to recognize time is dynamic. And while we may still be considering what our worth and value is, there are others who are moving swiftly to create what and set the tone for what they consider our worth and value. That's my opener. Wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Baez, would you like to chime in? Sure. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, first, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, the organizers um, of this wonderful uh, occasion, the 30th uh, anniversary uh, of this celebration, Black History Month. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Conscious Lyrics Foundation, and greet all the sisters and brothers here on the panel and those joining us uh, live on Facebook. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, with my sisters and brothers uh, to discuss uh, this very important uh, issue uh, or theme rather, decolonization. Uh, as a Puerto Rican living in St. Martin, um, I really uh, feel uh, colonized twice, um, but at the same time, uh, I feel, especially with this panel, 
that has been put together um, doubly motivated uh, to tackle uh, the questions of colonialism and coloniality. I think it's very interesting how some of the greatest authors or contributors to decolonial thinking are people who come from countries or islands who have still yet to be liberated from the metropolis. We could think of Franz Fanon, we could think of Amy Cesser, and the list goes on and on. And even in academia, I think, of some of my Puerto Rican brothers and sisters who are carrying the flag of decolonial thought, decolonial thinking in the humanities and the social sciences. They also uh, are living that colonial reality, but tackling the questions that will bring us further to emancipation. When I think of decolonization, the term decolonization, um, I think of two things, uh, two separate things, but certainly very related. Um, one is the juridical political aspect of colonization and on the other coloniality, the being, uh, the person, the people, the thought processes and the practices that occur under the historical colonization. Brothers and sisters, we look to our diaspora, our brothers and sisters in the Netherlands, in England, in France, in the United States, especially in academia, but also in ac activism on the streets, we see that there is a process of decolonization of museums, decolonization of public spaces, decolonization of the mind, decolonization of science, decolonization of research. And I think it's very interesting that it is precisely in the metropolis where the term decolonization is used the most. Equally ironic is that the term decolonization in our dependent territories is where it's used the least. There is a saying, a very embarrassing saying in Puerto Rico. We like to think of ourselves as the oldest colony of the world or the last colony of the world. And every time I hear that, I feel embarrassed. Um, we have this saying uh, in Spanish, uh, which means being embarrassed for another. And this might hit a nerve with those who are joining us live, but I think it's important uh, for me to raise this because in our insularism in Puerto Rico, we tend to think that our situation, our relationship to the United States is unique. And my living experience being a Puerto Rican living in St. Martin, I have come to know the similarities more concretely. And I know that the similarities are found both at the political juridical level, but also at the level of mentality, at the level of thinking, at the level of acting. To become an independent republic could never be the end goal of decolonization. To become an independent country can certainly be a first step. And that has been the case in large 
portions of the Caribbean. But if decolonization can happen in the metropolis and decolonization can be seen as a continuous and ongoing process, then we can join the process of decolonization in the non-independent Caribbean as well. Similarly, amongst the independent countries of the Caribbean and much of the global south, we can see the possibility of colonization and recolonization of those societies that are juridically independent. I would like us, or what I would like to bring to this discussion uh, is perhaps a consideration of the concept of coloniality and how coloniality permeates all societies that have been affected by modernity. And when I talk about modernity, I would like to talk about the flip side of colonial history starting with European expansion in the 15th, 16th century and another process of colonization that came through the European enlightenment. Here, I think it is very important to think about the structures of society and how they have evolved and I certainly join Cindy when she suggests that when we talk about decolonization, we do not only talk about the political, but we talk about the economic, we talk about the environmental, our relationship with the environment. We can also talk about sexuality. We could also talk about science and education and research. Why is it so important to make this distinction between colonialism and coloniality? Because even though we are speaking from a specific space, which is juridically colonial, there are spaces where we can decolonize and where decolonization is actually happening. And right now, broadcasted from St. Martin, we see this wonderful panel where we are practicing decolonization. This is a decolon decolonial exercise, what we're doing right here. And I congratulate uh, all the organizers once again. To answer the question, is decolonization realistic? Is independence realistic? for our countries, I think we have to go back and consider the basic question, the question that all our ancestors had to deal with, is the abolition of slavery possible? Is independence possible? Is decolonization possible? Is women's liberation possible? All of these questions that our ancestors also had to deal with, we are dealing with, we continue to deal with today. And I would think that decolonization is possible and independence for our countries is possible. I would like to think so, but the question remains, for what? In Puerto Rico, we say, independencia para que? So when we talk about decolonization and we talk about independence, I think it is very important to think about our imaginary, to think about our utopia, 
to think about what kind of society we want to live in. And to insert, and I'll stop here for the moment, but just to insert uh, a tone of controversy, I have to say, speaking from the Puerto Rican experience and speaking in an event that is dedicated to decolonization within the context of Black History Month, let us start thinking about what Black History Month celebration is all about. The economic structures and the political structures under which Puerto Rico continues to experience with laws forcing us to pay a debt that we don't know about, we don't know how to measure, we, don't, we, we, know, we know that there's an amount of debt that we have to pay, uh, uh, but austerity measures are taken, hundreds of schools are being closed, unemployment raising, a bunch of pirates from the United States taking advantage of tax breaks. We are seeing this process of recolonization of course, the poorest communities and the blackest communities of my country are the ones suffering the most. But very ironic is that the latest laws, the latest measures that are affecting my country, even before Hurricane Irma and before Hurricane Maria were imposed by a black president of the United States, Barack Obama. So when I'm sitting here with my brothers and sisters on this panel talking about decolonization within the context of Black History Month, I have to say clearly, and I'll say it from now, that we have to see that the current social, economic, and political system under which we live is a continuation of colonialism and a continuation of slavery. And there are certain people who would like to hijack the liberation movements and the black radical tradition, but they have absolutely no place in our thinking of decolonization. Let's make a distinction. Black History Month should not be simply about representation. Black History Month should be more and more about our consciousness and our relationship to the black radical tradition, the Caribbean philosophies of emancipation. With this, I would like to end my initial intervention. Thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you, thank you all. That was such a, I would say, enlightening response to the question from various angles. So I want our audience to remember that we, this is not a first time that we're expressing ourselves in terms of liberation. Mr. Suku reminded us that liberation has been always in our history. It's always been a part of our, of our, of our engagement to deconstruct the, the systemic implications of colonization is, is a continued story. Dr. Chen reminded us that these systems that we're in, you, they use very sanitized names for them, right? And create these illusions, you know, that we are free when we're not, right? And make it seem that the state is not threatening to our existence. Um, Ms. Gums Connor reminded us that time is of the essence. We can't wait. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as when it's a good time because those who are orchestrating this system and this process is using it to their benefit. And Professor Baez reminds us that we should not allow our message to be hijacked. We should take hold of it and this narrative. And we assert that decolonization is necessary we are in a colonial structure. There's no doubt about it. And we need to continue moving forward to see it as a holistic experience as we continue to deconstruct 
you know, this system that was placed on us. Professor Baez mentioned the austerity measures. He talked about the economy. And I, I want us to move in that direction as we are talking about this process and the, the coordinality of it and how much the region has been impacted economically, especially to the point where we suffer um, with natural disasters in this and now in this era of the pandemic. Our economies have suffered greatly you know, from these experiences and, and it's kind of been a continuous, a continuous um, strain on these pressures because of the fragility of our economies, sometimes to our own um, demise, but I would say because of the systemic implications of our spaces, our economies are not able to thrive and as we say, play fair into these economic systems that exist in the global north. So we want to talk a little bit about the impacts of austerity programs, uh, the role of the IMF and the World Bank in the region, and, and if anyone wants to mention specifically what is the impact in their own spaces. Anybody can go first. I saw you um, shaking your head, Professor Baez, you want to go ahead and, and start us off since you mentioned it first. Okay, thank you. And try to keep our, 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 our responses intact as we are running on time, but go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, yes, I think, you know, when I said that uh, there's so much in common between Puerto Rico and uh, St. Martin, and when I came to St. Martin three years ago, I, I, I saw these more concretely. It wasn't just a cultural affinities, uh, but it was also the relationship that each country, each island had uh, with the metropolis, or in the case of, uh, of, of St. Martin, the metropolis, huh? the Amsterdam and, and, and Paris, or sorry, the Hague and Paris. Um, what, um, uh, what we see is modern uh, mechanisms or modern day mechanisms of uh, colonialism, uh, where we're thought, we're, you know, we're, we're given this idea that we can uh, achieve more autonomy, but every time that we uh, take a step further in achieving a little bit more autonomy, what actually happens is um, that uh, there are new uh, impositions from the metropolis uh, that really curtail our auton autonomy. What am I talking about? More specifically, um, the CFT, uh, which is the acronym for the Dutch, um, for the um, Fiscal Control uh, Board. And in Puerto Rico, we also have this fiscal control boards, right? So that it limits economically where we could spend or how much we can spend, um, but it does not have a mandate uh, to protect uh, social, uh, social programs, social services, um, and rights, uh, acquired rights, rights that we have acquired uh, through struggle uh, through the, the decades past and, and, and through labor struggle uh, especially. Um, also, uh, I think when we're left with the options uh, for development, uh, we tend uh, to imitate the, uh, the metropolis and we look for solutions uh, that are based uh, on uh, profit gain uh, rather, as, rather than uh, social gain and, and, and strength. And I think that you know, any discussion about uh, decolonization has to be accompanied with a critique of capitalism and a critique of neo neoliberal capitalism or neoliberal colonialism, uh, as you may. As you may. Uh, this has been seen more sharply uh, with uh, the hurricanes that we've experienced recently. Um, uh, let's uh, talk about disaster capitalism. We could talk about that a little bit later, um, but also with the pandemic, we're seeing that uh, we're offered help from the metropolis, but this help always comes with certain conditions uh, that curtail our autonomy or self-determination. Let's just talk, leave it like that with self-determination, uh, which is essentially a human right. And I just desire to weigh in because what's really peculiar in these spaces that are called territories, colonies, non-independent, et cetera, in the Caribbean, especially alongside what's happening environmentally in terms of the climate change that persons are still in denial with, the same way they're in denial 
about colonization the same way they're in denial about the need for there to be some type of repair to the dam, whether you call it reparations, reparatory justice, some type of restitution, whatever word you use is not as important as that there has to be a process that restores some degree of balance socially, economically, politically, educationally, environmentally, and all these other areas of the building blocks of our respective societies. So I'll use case in point. When you say that term disaster capitalism, it kind of rears up a piece, you know, it's like the wings go on because that's exactly what we We like saw it firsthand. We didn't have to write a, a, a thesis, a paper, any type of research because we watched in our living space, Hurricane Irma come forward category five, mash up everything. People walking around almost in a stupor of existence. Not even a good two weeks later, Maria mashed down whatever was left and persons still in that zone. And we have watched from, 20, from September, 2017 to present, a whole new set of capitalist benefits that had no benefit to the persons that were mashed up. So my attitude was, I didn't need you to come here to do anything if you're gonna come and depopulate our Caribbean co community. We witnessed that we're still struggling with that very directly and we have a little more of a issue because as a colony of the US, we can't tell the US much. You can't tell them to stop this exploitation and to stop these inequities that are affecting people's ability to even live here, to find housing, to find decent health care. However, I won't even get into education. I will not go into the areas of any type of recreation. You know, we're seeing yachts and mega yachts surrounding our islands and persons living very comfortable and making that comment. If it's that difficult for you here, maybe you should do like other Virgin Islanders and go to Florida or Georgia or mm -hmm. Texas or somewhere. And this is a conversation that happens on a regular. This happens on a regular and it affects our ability to understand some of those socio-political macroeconomic realities that are affecting our ability to deal with the tax increases and the utilities increases that are pushing the native indigenous residents out of their own home yard. And then when there's a commentary or resistance of some sort, I won't even say a march, but if you just raise the area, then it makes it seem like you're radical. You're not appreciative of what opportunities have been afforded for, for you and you're not embracing these wonderful nuggets and treasures that are given to you from this sovereign entity. So that's one of the areas when you speak of those various austerity measures that has been a challenge because again, if your governance is grounded in the masterclass that is sovereign over you, it makes it very difficult to have a conversation in regard to decolonization, decolonization, independence, reparatory justice. When you say reparations, people are like, that's old. We don't need to have that conversation. And you start to nar. But at the end of the day, reparations in the 20th century was very different. Reparations in the 21st century is going to be tied to climate change, environmental improvements, all types of educational engagement, health care. I'm going to come back to that because we're in the midst of a pandemic. And even in the midst of a pandemic, they didn't stop this colonization, exploitation, ridiculousness. It just got like deeper and more deeper. If you don't do so, you're not gonna be able to go to work. If you don't do, Simon says so, Simon says this, that has to stop. Like that's the portion when you, from the minute you said that, Dr. Antonio, it just kind of brought that up that we have to navigate those strategies and they have to be strategies that are 
that are actually sequential and we need to do this together. I, need, I meant to say that first. Granted, I'm here in II St. Croix. I do a lot of my primary work in the Virgin Islands. My people from St. Martin, Curacao and Republica Dominicana, check that out. So I don't just think of just, hey, hey, 84 square miles, 34 square miles, 20 square miles. I think of the entire Caribbean Americas. And when I get in that zone, I think of the entire planet because we have that kind of engagement. And we're supposed to have those relationships because that's why they talk about world Ada and we talk about little Yad Ting. They think about generational engagement. And sometimes we just do the five-year plan, which is appropriate in certain areas, but I'm just saying it's important that we start to do with start to deal with institution building that is about recreating civilization because that's the layer that's around us. They're recreating civilization and depopulating our regions, depopulating our islands and making it some paradisical activity for others while people that live here can't live here, right? So I just needed to add those few little nuggets and treasures to the discussion. Thank you so I, much. It, Cindy, if I can just, if I can just take a page out of um, Dr. Chen's book, um, because again, I think here, here is a ground of commonality. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I referred to one of the factors as being debt, and poverty. This is something that, as I listen to you all, um, and, and as we know, when we, we keep a pace with what's happening in, in some of our other islands, this is the issue for uh, particularly uh, the, the colonial territories that is impacting us so greatly. Because in, for example, I, I, I look at what's happening in Anguilla even at this moment. Right now, our government is in the throes of a, a, a divergent conversation that has been spurred on by the people who are essentially saying the poor can't take it anymore, which is in the height of a pandemic, we will have a British government that has um, insisted that our local government sign a document, which means that in addition for every dollar that they are giving you, as um, uh, uh, Dr. Bears has said, is tied to conditions. And if they have no respect of person, the fact that in, a, in, a, in an island of about 12,000 persons, we are suffering under the weight of a staggering debt of over $400 million, which is a debt that was created as a result of a failure of two of our banks, all under the watchful, constitutionally responsible administering power all under their watchful eye. And that is why when I, 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 this particular quotation from Dr. King has spurred me in this particular um, year, because it, it is now like the, the plan is unfolding where you see how time is being used against the interests of our people. How could you, as a, 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 in our constitution, where the repository of power is in the hands of a British governor who sits and chairs our executive council, could have allowed, never saying, never raising the alarm that Anguilla was spiraling deeper and deeper into debt. And it is just always so coincidental, the time at which they choose to, um, to, to unearth their governance. And that time is always when the local populace 
is at its lowest. And I'm particularly moved, um, Dr. Chen, by your statement of depopulation. Because the one thing in Anguilla that we prided ourselves on was that perhaps as late as 1990, in the 1990s, early 2000s, 95% of Anguilla's land was owned by indigenous Anguillians. Now, if you look at where we are, so many Anguillians are losing their property. And this is being compounded by rigorous um, ingenuities of the British government who allowed us not just um, to spiral into this debt, but who are now locking the screws even tighter so that poverty is now running in the stream of which our survival is now, is now at. And, and so this, when we talk about, about decolonization, it is something that I hope that our people understand that we, 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 we are at the cusp, at least I can certainly say for Anguilla, and, I, and when I listen to, to, to what's happening in, in, in some of the other territories, and, and just from my own you know, knowledge of current developments, uh, you and St. Martin, for example, are in the same uh, um, headlock with the Hague. And while I certainly will acknowledge um, uh, very uh, um, directly the fact that some of our own leaders have put us and uh, into uh, uh, um, this predicament, what is doubly unfortunate is the fact that those who are imbued with oversight never seem to capture the oversight at the time when we, the people, could still emerge fairly unscathed. What seems to be the scenario that drives us deeper into colonialism is that they allow whatever are the misgivings and whatever are the, 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 the aspects of our own people, which ought to be curbed, they allow it until it meets their time schedule. And when they start to reel it in, the only people who are suffering are then the local populace. So we in Anguilla, where we all know as educated persons, land is your financial, that little, that, that, that financial component that allows you to, to not just assert your, your economic um, breadth, but more than that is that it gives you the talk and the speak to defend your borders. And so when, you, when, when, when we fall into this mire of debt, it acts as suppression. And it acts as depopulation, taking, sucking whatever is the lifeblood of our heritage so that we become um, uh, uh, just free of, 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 of the trappings of our culture. We, we, we are uprooted. And this is my fear. As to, as to that agenda of the administering powers who have far more experience in suppression and in, in, the, in the divide and rule concepts and in the, all those aspects that have allowed the proliferation 
of slavery, not just for the few hundred years when we were in the actual slavery, but who are now simply uh, utilizing those techniques to further keep us into and take us back into that mental and physical slavery. That because when you don't have land and when you are in debt, then ultimately you are taken back into not just a mental slavery, but a physical slavery as well. Thank you. Fire starter. Powerful, powerful. I've, I've been known, I've been, I, I've been known in my own country to be called the wasp. <laughs> a little sting, small, but a little sting. <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Koo. You know, but, but after those um, three Jaspanias set out ahead of me, there's absolutely nothing um, I need to add to this, but to be a cheerleader and to say that indeed, because the arguments of all three of my, 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 my brothers and sisters is, it, so if anything, it supports the, the, the thrust and the drive um, towards independence and for that rendezvous with victory. But it, the only thing I would add is that for those of us who are in those, those traditions and who will come into those traditions of, 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 of engagement, progressive traditions in particular, the radical traditions as we are, the revolutionary traditions, to continue this fight, to continue this teaching, this courting, this involvement of our people from all levels, and particularly from the ground up, as opposed to what the IMF and what the, the World Bank would be interested in of, 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 of padding up. You know? And so that's the encouragement I want to, to, to throw out there. Press on. Um, um, detail the designs and, 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 and the, the destruction and, and, and so forth of these systems that we're part of. Identify them, clarify them for our people. Listen to our people as well when they explain some of the, the challenges that they are facing that would make them sometimes have to consider um, a piece of bread as opposed to um, marching, um, even, if, if, even for their land. Press on. Um, the labor unions, the, 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 the seminal organizations for independence, the, the, the community groups that are in the progressive tradition, the environmentalists, and so forth. Um, press on, the activists who are, are artists, whether they are, they, are, they are taxi drivers. We want to let folks know that the breadth of our people can be involved in this engagement, can be part of an organization of, ch of movement and change. This is what I can, uh, you know, what I would like to, 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 to throw behind what the three colleagues have outlined so well. And, and that, that includes, when we talk of the designs and the details, and so it includes the sanitized statements that, for example, the, the, the statement of, of our brother Suja is that we will look at the austerity program, but the resiliency and the trust fund program of the, of the World Bank that, that the Dutch imposed on St. Juan to the World Bank, the, the word austerity is nowhere in there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a recovery program, it's a trust fund, you know, and so these sides words have the way well our people need to detail them and analyze them as they have always been it's you know it's, it's a new word for the same story for the same plan and what it will do to our people another part of it for those of us in the territories is to seek um, um, solidarity with advice from invite um, progressives from the independent countries. We don't have, have to wait only for definitions to come from the metropoles, as, as Brother um, uh, Antonio correctly noted, where, that, where those discussions sometimes start. And sometimes they do start there, not necessarily in our interests neither, and not necessarily in our paradigms and our, our interests in, in, in play, or, 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 or defining the narrative to benefit us at our best. But it is part of you know, world discussion. But to invite um, colleagues and brothers and scholars and artists and so on, as Suja so, uh, does annually for, for the last 30 years, as we do with the book fair and so forth, from our region to, 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 to inform our people, to share with our people, to show both the commonality and the uniqueness of, 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 of our region as we move forward. And how that region then is also linked to the wider world towards progress. So we dissected the economy and we looked at how do we unmask the presentation of institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and the impact that they have on the fabric of our societies 
and the social fabric that has been deconstructed. And, and as um, Mr. Siku mentioned, this is not the first time. There are many examples of the IMF practices in various countries. So we should not be surprised in this space to what the impacts of these policies are. Yes, the names may be masked in different, um, you know, I would say, how do you say, it? friendly words, and to be, and to seem less threatening to the spaces because you're trying to help us recover, you know, after three years after you know the hurricane, and in the middle of a, in the middle of a pandemic in our most fragile states. We talked about how the uh, the metropole is offering a hand of helping us to recover, but yet that hand comes with a lot of stringent implications, you know, to our to our detriment, I would say, in terms of the policies that are attached to these um, to these injections of, of money that we're still waiting on in some cases, in some spaces, right? So we want to remember that the economic element, and I think um, Dr. Baez mentioned that before, that even in our quest, just looking at the political system is not enough. We must examine the economic framework and how that is attached to the holistic approach that Dr. Chen talked about in terms of our economy and the and the environment. You know, it should be a holistic expression to what um, this should look like, and that the predatory lending practices of these institutions that Attorney Gums Connor mentioned in terms of you know what does the poverty look like in our spaces and how important it is to hone on to our most greatest asset, which is land. And I might mention here also that the colonizers are very keen to understand that why territory and land is important because it is an expansion of their space, right? It is an expansion of their reach in this region from a geopolitical standpoint. So it's important to, for us to know and understand that our spaces, our territories are important and there is value there. Although they might claim to say that we are asking and we are a burden, but they know exactly why they're remaining and attaching to us for that economic and geopolitical um, reason. Our next point, I believe it was Attorney Gums Canada mentioned the mental implication, you know, of this decolonization process. You know, why are some of our people still not convinced that we need to be um, in a, in the efforts of moving swiftly towards you know the liberation struggle or liberating ourselves from the lasting impact of this colonial process. And I would like for us to discuss a little bit, how does this uh, mental implication that uh, Fanon warned us about, right? He told, he, he emphasized that the mental, the psychological um, implications of this colonial process and what it looks like. Um, uh, Professor Baez mentioned as well that decoloniality also has a psychological element to it. You know, that sometimes that if you are in a colonial space, you are acting and sometimes not even, conscious that you are carrying out you know the agenda you know of those who want to keep us in these systems but you are just practicing you know what you see or what you've been told so can we talk a little bit about the mental and the psychological impact of um, colonization and how important it is in this process and for, for us to move forward if i may point something i, I think we, we, keep, that we keep going back to and i keep trying to avoid um of, of our people's relation to this thing. The, the countries that have moved on to independence in our region and beyond, um, they didn't start the process yesterday. They didn't start the process a year before their independence. They didn't start the process two or three or 20 or 30 or even 50 years before the independence. Usually it was an engaged process that lasted for quite some time, including the European countries who had, you know, um, it, it, um, ravaged each other and who had to fight their wars for independence for 80 years and so forth, you know. So, you know, a lot of the territories um, that, that we are, that, that are yet independent, the, the, the discussion, the detailing, even the formation of foundations, the concerns with, 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 with the reparation foundations, the, having artists that, that can articulate their specific reality instead of just a region-wide or even international reality, is, is new on board. 
you know i remember with the the, the guadalupe independence movement the, that that rush of, of, of articles that came out in the 80s and so forth the early 80s and before they can reach the 90s the 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 the, 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 the french uh, agencies that sought to undermine them had effectively done that including assassinations including um, undermine econ economic viability so it this is part of what i meant earlier when i said about the ongoing struggle we have to respect that aspect of it as it relates to the specific territory and to our people from the ground up and this is what i say too about going to them to speak to them to ask them why so maybe ask the big question well, why they, the people this and that well no i i, I go with Fano, I, I go with chain this one you know the truth is in the people and sometimes when you see the people hold back and say boy uh, you know, it don't mean they don't mean no. You know, and look, look, look at the time that it took the Saint Martin people uh, through a pan oh, through through a pandemic, and in step with the world's protest movements within such a, a health threatening feature to come out in over two thousand people to march on a frontier that is not that 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 they hold not just for the juridical or the constitutional or the or the or the, or the uh, you know, the, the public administrative features, but that they had internalized even before the end of slavery as an element of their identity. And so it was worth reaching out and standing up and defending without the political leaderships in both, both capitals of, the, of both territories. You know, and they came out and they marched on the frontier in, in, in the 16th of uh, September. These, are some, these movements are telling us something about what is within our people and where we should approach them. You know, they, they, we talk of, uh, the brother Bias talked about earlier about the, the feminist movements and the environmental movements and so on. The, the, move, the, the, the developments that the feminist movement and environmental movements are making in the Caribbean now, because there's kind of a new outlook and a new approach. Yeah, but both of them, have been active in the region in both the smaller territories and in the larger countries for at least a good 50 years. One of the reasons they were, they were rejected by the, the, the people of the nation wasn't the people are stupid. The people were not stupid. It was their approach. You know, you are telling the poor fishermen, you, you, you the minister's wife, you, you're educated in London or in, 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 in um, Sorbonne, and you're going to come down, you're going to tell the fishermen he can't fish there. You don't explain to him why. And when you don't do it, you say, oh, they're stupid, they don't care, they don't know nothing about the land. And nothing. Yeah, but that attitude, Laming points out relative to the feminist movement in the early days, the, 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 the movement was led by women, and sometimes some, some sisters may not want to hear it explained like this, and I'm not the one to get into that kind of, of, of thing, but were led by women who had domestic workers in their homes that they were abusing. So now when she stand up on the podium for her husband to talk during election time, her maid is looking at her body. You see she there, my son? She slapped me off yesterday in, 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 her, in her kitchen. She called me this and that. This is a reality that we have to deal with. And this is why I keep stressing the importance of keep pressing on, engaging the system, keep with the levels of organization, um, um, overlap the organizations. But we have to speak to our people. We have to listen to them. We have to bring them into the conversation, bring them into the debates. You know, so that when we move, in essence, to me, that's how a movement really catches catches on and move on, like like magma. I don't think a movement is so much like a wave. I think it's more like a it, it moves like magma. You know, and so these are the areas I am concerned with. How do we, not how do we, but those that are doing it already to continue to find new ways to do it. Those that are come on board with it to engage that process from the ground up. You know, whether it's in economic areas, whether it's in cultural and social areas, whether it's in the community um, councils and so forth. And another thing that I'm going to end with relative to that is that, you know, sometimes we speak up and, and uh, because the economic uh, discussion is, 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 is some, takes a primacy often in these type of discussions relative for independence or not, you know, which when, when it's not, you know, it's, it's yeah, but fine, let it take its primacy. However, we don't have the luxury and no independence movement never in the history of humankind had luxury to relate to only one level, to only speak over. We, we, have, to, we have to be economically independent before we come. No, that is, that is, that's not going to happen based on what my colleague said relative to the, to the, to the, to the predatory practices of, 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 of capitalism and their institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and, and corporations that, that call in their government. We forget what has happened in some of the South American countries. It was the corporations that invited the State Department to call Washington in to unseat the government that didn't want to give them land, back to the issue of land again. These are, this is our history. This is part of our reality. 
These are some of the, 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 the features too that those of us who speak like this, who engage with, with our people, need to continually bring to our people as we fine tune what is happening specific to our territory, link it to the region, link it to the other territories that are not yet independent, bring, you know, always seek solidarity and court solidarity with the independent uh, uh, countries of our region, and particularly those progressive movements in, 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 our, in our, in our region. And that type, that type of, 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 of engagement and activity to me is what generates a movement in these overlapping areas. We don't have the luxury to only talk of the environment, to only talk of, of um, to only talk of uh, um, the economy. It's an overlapping area that we constantly have to engage. And, and some of us are going to be better in some areas than not. And we have to recognize that and work with each other. And I think that is one of the, 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 the pluses of Suja's work here in St. Martin um, relative to the Conscious Lyric Foundation, relative to the book fair. You know, um, he, he reminds me of some of those old time um, 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 Caribbean leaders that were, you know, proto-nationalists and those who then went further and the, the John LaRose out of London. He reminds me of those type of people because he had that kind of, of collegial camaraderie relationship that was so effective in moving an entire generation of Caribbean people from emancipation to independence, you know, and we can do no less. And those of us still in these territories, we have to recognize that this struggle that we are in we are, we are yet at the seminal stage. Some of us know, yes, we went to, to we, 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 we've been you know, inundated with bourgeois education. So we, of course, we know everything, you know, and so we go back to our people and we know everything. What's wrong with you? Don't you see how simple it is? You know, but no, no, it, it, it is simple to them. They know, like Che Chavera said, they know. They have a very good idea of the praxis relative to the theory. They have a very, very good idea, you know, and, um, but how do we make it work? How do we make it work with them? A pace and, 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 and engage in pace don't mean you're not being revolutionary. It don't mean you're only being, um, uh, you, you, you slow with it. The pace is varied, but we have to engage the, 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 our people, the different organizations. We have to seek allies of some, in, in solidarity and, and, and talk to our people and listen. That is the key thing I want. So that overlapping aspect that I took or uh, uh, went around the ball, please to say. Um, <laughs> That was the same <laughs> ball field. Go ahead, Sister Queen Josie. Go ahead, Sister Queen Josie. I can see you were ready to go oh, in. Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, I just wanted to jump in there with uh, with um, Mr. Sekou because my 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 things are clinging in my in my head, and so one of the things that. Um, as we talk about having this conversation with our people, I sometimes wonder, now that I, hearing you express it, whether we have partially um, contributed to where we are. One of the things, for example, in, in, from a mentality standpoint of where we would say as black people that we don't want our children to suffer what we suffered. And, and sometimes I wonder now when, when we look at all, you're putting all these, these the, the, all the pieces of a, of a very large puzzle of colonialism. And sometimes I wonder whether that thinking, that mindset on our part is partially for why we hold ourselves in. Because we know that in a fight for independence and in a fight for a better uh, uh, ability to chart our own course also means that there is going to be a rite of passage of hardship. And sometimes I wonder if we have, we have grown into such a level of comfort and by comfort doesn't mean that we are out of poverty, but we have become a, we have become acclimatized to what we know. And so sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to think as I, as I listen to, 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 to what you're saying, the mindset, the conversation, whether that fear of the unknown, notwithstanding, it, it, it goes to what our dignity is and that that should be what is leading the way, whether that mindset that to leave what we know, to go to into what we don't know may mean hardship, which 
either we are no longer maybe from this generation standpoint are willing to engage again and whether by the way we have adjusted our mindset towards our children they are perhaps not invested in the thought even that the lifestyle which they currently enjoy no matter how suppressed that might be is still better than going into something i aka independence which may mean some 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 small uh, detraction from where they are and and i think that that goes also into the conversation that sometimes you get from outside coming in which is what do you have to go independent on? What is our value? Your interism, but it gives the impression as though we have little else. That is in part, I would also um, submit, comes from the fact that we have not intensified our true abilities. We have not diversified our economies as we should have. And so this concept of what is our worth and what is our value is tied to only what we see in the here and now. And so I, I, I think that there is running along with this economic um, decolonization discussion has to be also um, the mindset that must also go with that, that says you are not even what your fullest potential is. Give yourself a chance to explore that full potential. And in doing so, yes, like anything, you can't just run up and be a lawyer today and run up and be, uh, have a master's in this or a doctorate in that. It takes time, but you must be invested in that time, knowing that that end result is going to be to the benefit, not just of yourself. And even if you have to be like the Moses who hasn't, who hasn't seen the promised land, you have to believe that you are on a journey to protect the generations coming after you. And I think that we have we, 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 there's an onus and a responsibility on us. And as I hear you, Mr. Siku, it tells me, even from my activist standpoint, that even though it comes to me naturally, that my dignity is worth more than what you give me as a dollar. And if tomorrow I have to go in the ground and take a hoe and, and to help feed myself, I have no difficulty in shedding what, what this perception is to do that. But maybe we have to have that conversation. And I also want to say this aspect, that as I explore that thought, I also wonder whether in the concept of what the administering power and how they regulate us in the invisible hand, whether a dampening of our culture helps to create the pathway of this, of this closeted feeling that so many of our people have, that we, there, there's, there's not much more to us. And I am one of those that the more, the older I get now, I feel as though we should also be moving towards a position where just like in our constitutions, the administering powers would love us to have every manner of, of, of rights being human rights. We should also be fighting to perhaps have our cultures, our culture of your territory be a human right. Because when we think of mindset, when we think of mindset, our mindset has been fostered and cultivated by the culture that we have been, uh, uh, has been given to us by our forebears. 
that culture of how we raised our children was what produced us today. Yet, we are being written into law through our constitutions. All manner of other things that are in a, in a direct collision course with our culture. When you tell me, for example, that as in the case of Anguilla, that you have had to pass by order in council, suggesting that um, corporal punishment is abolished and give the impression filtering down through your secondary legislation that you cannot touch your children and you cannot, you cannot uh, um, uh, uh, correct them in the manner that our forebears did. You can't look at the issues that we are having in our schools now in abstract. You can't look at the, the complete dismantling of respect that we would traditionally have for our forebears and our educators and look at it in a bubble. It comes because just as you have diluted us as a people, as a black people, to be proud and to be looking always towards the eyes of freedom, you are also psychologically entrapping us into a space that completely dilutes our culture and therefore helps to foster that mindset which we in this space and others like us are beating back against, but are having to go through heavy water because our culture and that mental component has also been tampered and tarnished by those who do not share the complete and fullest advancement of black people as a people in our territory, competent and courageous enough to chart our own future. That's my take. And I, I will just say echo, echo, because I, I would like to share, I like using literature and I like using political literature to just kind of hone in on things. And this is coming from a quotation from 1942. Why in the past have we been so unconcerned about expressing our ancestral anxiety in a direct manner? The urgency of this cultural problem escapes only those who are determined to put their hands over their eyes so as not to be disturbed from an artificial peace. And at any cost, even the price of stupidity and death. And that's coming from the great camouflage by Suzanne Césaire. We're very quick to remember Amy Césaire, but we need to remember his wife, right? And how she was able to put forward this mindset back in the 1940s with all of that chaos happening between France and Britain and the Caribbean spaces, et cetera. And it speaks to this psychological mental framing that is part of that trauma like persons in you know 21st century everything is trauma you know before it used to be you would find your lawyer your accountant and your dentist now everybody has a therapist a psychiatrist and a counselor and what has happened is there's been these intentional framings that have dismantled the very core of our humanity so it's almost impossible or seemingly impossible to even have the luxury of time for even any type of reflection outside of this rigorous institutionalized dismantling of the very core of our consciousness. Like we're, we're no longer able to be engaged even when we have these types of discussions, this is a very safe space. And we know that one another are here to support, engage, and offer that heartical 
I dare with you. I dare with you. That's solidarity. That's solidarity, not just in the discourse, but solidarity that we could march together, write together, work together, live together, try together, which is very different, very different than what many of our people remember. They remember the consistency throughout the 20th century, much less earlier. And I'm just going to go from the 20th century forward. They remember the betrayal, the disloyalty, the assassinations that were so frequent and so consistent that persons were terrorized. They are, it's terrorism. It's not white supremacy. There's nothing supreme in what was done. It's outright terrorism, genocide, that kind of intentional dismantling of the very core of our humanity. So many of us, and it's been said by each of us, have had the luxury to analyze, engage in various perceptions, develop papers and seminars and conferences and congresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, it's really through the cultural creatives, and I'd like to make sure I highlight this, cultural creatives that use music, theater, art, dance, visual art, performing visual art to that layer of engagement that allow for our people to, we saw him stop breathing after eight minutes, so many seconds and the world shut it down. But we didn't remember the other people that were exposed to the same type of terrorism. And that put that mindset where it literally freezes people. We went from a certain space of freedom and by the directive of a system that has been known to execute medical terrorism and medical apartheid to the level that is still unprecedented in this world. We started putting on masks, washing our hands until our melanin came off and we stopped even connecting with one another, right? Claiming a disease that is still doing what? dismantling our very core of our humanity. And we haven't, how come they didn't tell anyone to take vitamin C? What happened to we're gonna take deep breaths, six feet apart, of course, in the sun? How come we didn't identify any of the scientific research of what's happening that is dismantling the very core of how we organize and research and give study and practice? And I say this with this kind of attitude because that's the kind, people are, are so frightened. People have become COVID police. They are frightened. They're frightened of their own family because we did not have everything together before this pandemic. We were dealing with disaster capitalism from the last set of hurricanes. And I'm just speaking right here. And before the hurricanes of 2017, we were still recovering from the economic downslide that was mismanaged by some of the same leaders and entities that you've shared so eloquently, each and every one of us. So this is an opportunity for us to revamp, reconnect, and authentically repair the damages that were done. So it's not gonna be the reparations of the 20th century where it's just gonna be a check and you know everybody's gonna get a million dollars or a million EU, whatever, yen, whatever, because it has no value. It's going to be that our very environments have to change. If you can find medicine that you're claiming is going to keep people safe and you can't bring fresh drinking water, you can't provide housing so persons aren't in a lean-to while you making them line up for medication, you can't make sure that everybody has some access to land that is arable, that they can actually plant food, agriculture, astronomy, the arts and sciences that govern the universe, architecture, construction, trades. These are the basic four. And we tend to overlook that because people are traumatized. You have to be virtually bipolar, drinking on schizophrenic to survive the madness that has been imposed on each and every one of us and our families. The fact that people of African, native, indigenous ancestries have survived at all is godly beyond measure. It's only through the blessings, period, period. Because there has not been that cohesiveness 
on this trauma. And I'm not just speaking of a post enslavement trade piece because this was happening for millennia. This is not ultra new. This was before this enslavement experience. There was this intentional dismantling of the humanity. That's why the culture has been compromised so severely that people think that culture is outside of themselves. They do not embrace that soul self being self consciousness that would make them feel that it is important to embrace and to utilize all that our ancestors have prepared for us, for us to be able to try to net yard. We don't have to undo. We don't have to undo. We have to make it so. We have to make the change now. We do not have the luxury of time. And this is coming from a space of where we speak of our children, our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear that we're going to do this for another 25 years to discuss till discuss can't finish. They need to see it today. And they need to see it with some connection to the culture that is grounded in our heritage, that allows us to heal, that allows us to embrace edification, that allows us to understand technology. And when I say technology, I don't just mean AI. I'm talking about the technologies that govern how we deal with civilization building. When we do that, then a good 75% of what we're discussing, this land issue, the environmental issue, that psychological framing, that mindset, they have us talking about a growth mindset when we were doing Ubuntu and Ma'at for millennia, for millennia. This is not a new thing. This is just us using our ancestral mnemonics to bring it into a current space that we can do something that's deliverable, that is tangible, that changes how we live like now, 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 and not just for five years, for with some degree of perpetuity involved. Like that's the psychological framing is challenging. We're seeing people that are losing their balance in their frame at an all time high during a pandemic and cannot get support and care because you're telling them to stay home. You're not providing a system that allows for care that restores our humanity. We, we have to work on that. And it will not just be addressed by false prophets claiming that certain treatment is going to heal all 7.8 billion and counting on the earth. There has to be another, another approach, another approach so that we can restore our shared humanity. These are such valid points and Unfortunately, time is of the essence. As we discussed, time is racing against us and we need to you know, engage in action. Our last question I would like for our panelists to take about two minutes. I know it's a very um, impactful uh, response that you would wanna give on the question of reparations. Um, Dr. Chenzir, she started off talking about it already and the holistic approach to reparations. So I would like for our panelists to you know, give their thoughts and you have two minutes to do so. And Dr. Baez, you wanna start off since you didn't say anything the last go round? Sure, uh, I'll see how quick I can I can be, but I would like to say that I, I, um, I really appreciate when uh, Brother Saku uh, stated that we do not have the luxury uh, to look and to analyze our coloniality from one perspective and just the economy, look at the economy. And I, I really appreciate where Dr. Chen and, and, and Sister Josie Gums uh, Connor uh, pointed out that, you know, the most important uh, aspect of uh, in, in the analysis of, uh, of our uh, colonial condition uh, is the dehuman, 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 dehuman Dehumanizing, yes, <laughs> a character uh, of, of 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 colonialism, and you know when I look at uh, when when I look at uh, when earlier when I said that you know I see I feel colonized twice because I'm a Puerto Rican living in uh, Saint Martin. 
um, but I also feel blessed uh, because I have had the opportunity and the privilege uh, to, to observe and not only observe, but participate and engage in decolonizing spaces um, like agriculture, um, like education and, 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 and decolonizing education uh, when, when, when I, uh, in the arts, uh, in, 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 in participating in, in dance and music in all the cultural production uh, that is, and I see this happening and similarities between Puerto Rico and, and St. Martin, um, I, you know, then I, I, my humanity is enhanced. I really feel uh, doubly human and, and doubly decolonized um, mm -hmm. when I participate uh, in, in those. When, when we think about reparations, you know, it's funny, I think it was you, uh, Cindy, that mentioned that says when we hear reparations, people, some people make fun of us. They say, leave that alone, leave that aside. And it, it you know, again, the European Commission in 2018 uh, recognized the need for yes. reparations. And, you know, here in the Caribbean, we're telling ourselves, you know, this is ridiculous. Why are we talking about the past, you know? And I think that, you know, reparations, uh, when we think about reparations, we have to think beyond the context of capitalist coloniality and this individualism and this individual gain. When we talk about reparations, we have to think about our collectivity, what we can do as a collective and how we can build and strengthen institutions uh, that will, uh, uh, of course, uh, guarantee the space of our emancipation. Uh, I'm talking here about, you know, of course, education uh, from, from my perspective, but also those other spaces that need to be developed. When we talk about reparations, we need to think about the relationship that we have with uh, the metropolis. And we have to think about, you know, everything that we talked about, uh, debt uh, and debt being slavery and being a continuation uh, of slavery and how we need to cancel uh, that debt huh? and cancel that debt just not so that we can take out more loans, not cancel that debt so that we can imitate uh, all the, 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 the same mode of production that has been imposed upon us uh, for centuries, uh, but cancel that debt and uh, at the same time think about and imagine what kind of society we want uh, to live in. Uh, I, I will leave it at that for the sake of time. Thank you. Mr. Sekou, you Dubois had said in the yeah, Dubois had said in the early part of the last century that the, the color line is going to be one of the he said deep, I, I believe I'm paraphrasing him, but certainly one of the definitive um, uh, areas of struggles and engagement for the 20th century. Um, I definitely don't carry no kind of weight like W.E.B. Dubois, but I, 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 I would dare say that um, the reparations movement, the movement for repertory justice is going to be engaged as we climb into this new century as one of the, de the definitive areas of struggles and victories um, there. There's been no doubt it's going, it's going to happen. The various forms in which it's going to happen, I would, I'm just gonna leave three, three, three areas to, to make it short that, that folks listening in can share with each other, can share with their family, students listening in, husband, wives, taxi drivers, girlfriend, boyfriend can share and just take their time and read the, the 10 point um, plan of repertory justice um, that the CARICOM um, yes. are doing as a group, which, which doesn't deny each country in there from from, from, from securing the, the information specific to its country, but the approach, especially with, with somebody like a Beckles at the, when I heard Beckles was, was the director, but I said, it's done, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, with somebody like Beckles at it, um, uh, a, a great um, uh, intellect um, who has a good sense of our people and, and our countries and so forth in the region. Um, to look at that, it's online at CARICOM, the 10 point plan, which includes as, as Brother um, Baez noted there about cancellation of debt, talk about the, um, uh, technology transfer. It's a range of areas to approach. And then the, the, the second guide that we can use um, is um, Amiri Baraka's The Essence of Reparation, which um, I work with House of Mahesi Publishers and we had the honor to publish him as, as one of the great radical um, of, of, of the Americas, and we were able to bring into the Caribbean uh, and publish him in St. Martin. The Essence of Reparation, which is a very interesting and unique guideline. The professor of government at, uh, at UWE, Professor Lewis, pointed out that um, because a lot of people know Baraka, 
relative to his radicalism, relative to his leftist, leftist politics, and so on. He says, you don't have to agree with his political position to understand the very key and definitive areas um, that, he's, that he, he is suggesting that particularly Black Americans would approach. And why it's important that in our specific territory or country that we approach this, um, this, this issue, this discussion, this, these proposals of reparation based on, on what is going on in our country and then seek the wider solidarity as we send it up to, to, these, to these capitals, uh, which includes sometimes some, some of the countries in our region. Brazil and the US are countries that, we, that, will be apply, that this issue will apply to. Um, as much as the European metropoles, as much as some of the trade organizations that still exist in places like, like um, that are over 100 years old, that exist in places like Senegal, that you have to approach mm -hmm. about this issue. So those three areas, you know, those two areas, and the last area, my brother Fabian wouldn't forgive me if I don't point them out relative maybe to the, to the colonialists, and we don't need to help them. But Fabian always points out relative to reparation that he said, <laughs> is it three? I haven't written that, right? He said there's four areas that those who, we are approaching with this issue that we're charging with this issue have to deal with. And so he goes like this. I think it's part of the Judeo Christian, um, and brother, uh, Bias, you might, you might know it better than I. I think it's part of the Judeo Christian traditions as well, which have universal application. Four points. One is mea culpa. You have to admit and confess of the guilt and the wrongdoing. Yes. The second one is control. So it's an expression of remorse and apology by promise never to do it again. The European countries have apologized. They, they went to step two, but they didn't deal with step one yet, <laughs> you know? And the, the, the third one is penance. That's the reparation. That's the reparation elements there. And certainly there, there are varied material um, issues in there that, 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 that we, will, that we are in, will apply for, will engage, and will, and, will, and will win. And then the fourth one is absolution. You have to ask for forgiveness. You know, so if I could just throw out those three areas that uh, we can follow up on and folks can search online and so on. The book, Essence of Reparation by Amida Baraka, the 10-point plan of repertory justice by CARICOM, and these four points that Fabian always drill in me that we have to deal with. It might be an issue at a moral level, but it's applied directly to the material level of when we speak about and when we engage and when we gaining on this issue of regulatory justice. Ms. Gump? Yes, I'll very, I'm going to make sure I leave some time for Dr. Chen to wrap us up. So I will just say to, my, to Mr. Sekou there that sometimes in, as lawyers, we tell the court, there's nothing that I can usefully add. And so I would, I would, I would say that at this point, because I think those are exactly the points that go towards uh, um, you know, go towards reparations. But I will just add one little aspect, which is to say that certainly from the, from the Anguilla standpoint, where our administering power is the UK, I will just throw in there that their propensity for commitment is quite solidly there since it is, I think, in 2018 that they made their last payment of monies to the slave, original slave owners uh, in the UK uh, for, uh, for, their, for, the, for having lost their slave uh, plantations, having lost their plantations. They made the final payment in 2018, having started in uh, just after uh, the, the declaration of um, the emancipation. So at that time, when they did that, when they made that payment, the research shows that it was 40% of their budget that they committed to, uh, to those former slave owners. So their history in being able to carry a debt and service it is, uh, is certainly there. And I think that when we think of reparations, uh, we should have no difficulty in being able to advocate quite strongly that uh, for, the, for the legacy that they have um, levied against uh, a people who were free in Africa, that uh, they uh, can make that similar commitment, the mea culpa, to, uh, to the people of our territories. Thank you. Dr. Chen? 
I would echo everyone and just focus on a quote that's pretty simple. A people without the knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And we know that's from the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And when we speak of reparations, as I said in the beginning, reparations is not the same in 2021 as it was in the 20th century or even earlier. Our whole form of preparation is going to be about establishing more organic solidarity with deliverables. Let me put it better. We have to do the work together and we have to build. This is not a time to just do anything other than we have to build and restore civilization. I'm not really, I don't come from that orientation of just apologize to me because apology without a change of behavior to me is useless. So if you're gonna apologize and there's no change of behavior, then keep your apology to yourself, leave it on a piece of paper, put it in a bottle, throw it in the seat. However, we have to look for the behavioral change because that goes back to the psychological, the sociological, as well as our physiological framing to be able to handle repairing the damages done to our very core of our humanity beyond all of the capitalism, imperialism, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. We're developing a new form of unification, liberation, and social governance that's going to be beneficial for all of we. That's where we're supposed to be going when we speak of this reparatory justice piece. And I would be remiss if I did not echo, there are changes that have come forth. We were very fortunate in a recent Caribbean Pan-African Network meeting to just hear how the CARICOM Reparations Commission has, expanding, has expanded its reach to incorporate those non-self-governing territories, et cetera, and so forth, so that even though we may not be able to be part of CARICOM because of what them they say, we can still engage in this process. And I really want to extend thanks to the chair, of course, the Honorable Sir Hillary Beckles, and all of the other members of CARICOM's Reparations Commission. And I want to thank the ambassador, David Thomas Young, for sharing that with us in a recent CPAN meeting. And we have persons that are here from the We Want Bonaire Back organization that has been pushing this reparatory justice, reparation, self-determination for years in those spaces that we overlook, like Bonaire, that we overlook inclusive of Aruba, Curaçao, et cetera. I need for persons to know that there are organizations, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, African Communities League, RC 2020. And I put it out there because we forget when we talk like this, there are organizations that are working towards building. And when we build together, then reparations is just a matter of moments, no longer decades and years. Maybe it will be within the squinette because it's gonna happen because what? We making it so, just so, make it so. And with that, I say a blessed good evening, Hotep, greetings to everyone. This has been an honor and a privilege. Well, everyone, thank you so much to my fellow brothers and sisters for grounding with me this evening and with the world, because we're on Facebook Live. It was a very enlightening discussion. I wanna give you all each 30 seconds to Bye -bye. say, your goodbyes and we want to start with attorney gums connor sure well i just wish to say i i really thoroughly enjoyed uh this discussion um really kind of opened up uh our thoughts uh, sometimes you have to go to the mountain top and mm -hmm. and and then descend and go back into the field to work so I, I really want to thank all the, the panel. First time I'm meeting you all uh, in this space and, and at all virtually, but it has been an absolute pleasure. Miss Cindy, thank you for your excellent uh, moderation of this uh, panel. You really dug into us and got us into um, areas perhaps we, we had not originally intended. 
And of course, the mastermind behind it all, Mr. Suja Reef. I wish to say my absolute thanks uh, for being, uh, for relying on whoever recommended that I should be a part of this panel. And I'm so absolutely thrilled to have been here. And I do hope that, uh, you know, uh, Professor Chen has, uh, has already, Dr. Chen has already said that, you know, Black History Month can be 365 days in a year. We are already sporting what starts to, starts the discussion yeah. so let's hope that perhaps we can uh, meet in a different space and explore uh, all to the benefit i hope of our people who will be i hope listening digesting and be ready to to put their hands to the wheel um, in the work to make it happen thank you, thank you. professor Baez. How many times can you thank uh, your brothers and sisters virtually? Um, I will not stop uh, thanking. Thank you, uh, thank you, brother Shuja, uh, for uh, and and also uh, colleagues uh, for putting this uh, together. Um, every time that we get together, we take the opportunity, we make the occasion to engage uh, in dialogue, respectful dialogue. Um, that is an act of love, and that is an act of decolonization. Um, decolonization and acts of decolonization are acts of love. And so I would just like to send a virtual hug and kiss to all sisters and brothers who are with us uh, this evening. And um, Suja and uh, Conscious Lyric Foundation, I would like to say, keep up the good work. We are decolonizing here. Uh, in St. Martin, uh, uh, extending that hand of solidarity to all our brothers and sisters around the world. Thank you. Professor Chen? I'm very grateful for what we were able to accomplish this evening because each of us were able to bring our skills, talents, and expertise and share some different elements to the protocol that's going to move us forward. I'm very honored and humbled. You are an awesome moderator, Sister Queen Cindy Peters. So I needed to just pause because you you summarized what we said after every question. I said, we said that? We said that. So I'm very grateful for your ability to create that synergy and to synthesize and, and streamline what we were doing so that we can actually get it done, right? Brother Shuja, you done know family. You know how we stay family. So I'm very appreciative of what Conscious Lyrics Foundation has facilitated, you know, for 30 years and growing. And with that, we're very, very humbled. I say Hotep in terms of just greeting everyone in peace and praying that we all can stay safe and well until our next grounding together. Give thanks. Last but certainly not least, Mercy. I want to give thanks and praise to, to Suja Odeli, Cindy, the organizers, Conscious Lyrics, for bringing us in, uh, my colleagues, brothers, sisters on, on the panel, um, to all the folks listening in and who will be listening as this continue to go down the line on, on the web, um, for bringing us into this um, part or this stream of the continuum that we're part of. We belong to a tradition. Hopefully we can invest into this tradition in such a way that others will prosper even better and further as we go down the road and as we continue to engage um, love, labor, liberation. Well, this concludes our 30th anniversary celebration of Black History Month. And I would like to thank you all for tuning in and engaging in this grounding session with us. I will be remiss if I did not shout out again to the Conscious Lewis Foundation for being 30 years strong and committed and courageous ongoing struggle that uh, Brother Lasana reminds us that this is not something that we're doing new, it's in our DNA and we should continue to push forward um, in our quest for liberation. I also wanted to um, shout out to the team behind what you see. Without them, we wouldn't be here this evening. We want to shout out to Sisters radio for allowing us to host and for being a continued partner and last but not least i would like to send a special good night to my parents 
Linda Lake and Hector Peters, thank you for allowing me to be in this space and allowing me to have a voice to speak out against the injustices and being supportive in that way. And I personally want to thank the Conservatives Foundation for humbly asking me to moderate this evening. It was my honor to be here and allow and to be at a 30th celebration. I had a really good time and I hope you did too. Look forward to the book fair activities because we are still you know, in the process of decolonization and that's the foundation of our book fair. And see us on June 3rd through the 5th virtually, but we will uh, continue. You know, the work is necessary, it's important, and we're on a time slot that we have to that we have to you know be ahead of the game as attorney connor reminds us so thank you again for tuning in tonight and continue the process it doesn't happen overnight but it's a this is you being here is a part of that process and hope you share this information with your family and loved ones and continue in our struggle for freedom good night Thanks. Thanks.